Chris began competing on sailboards four years ago and realised he was a natural. His first big win came two years ago when he took out the World Youth Championship. Since then, he has won the team event at last year's World Windsurfer titles and this year he won the Open Mistral World Championship. Over the past six months, he has put everything into his sailboarding. During countless overseas trips, he won the Singapore and Malaysian Opens and finished second in the German Nationals. Chris also went to Pusan in South Korea for a pre-Olympic regatta in which bad luck saw him finish out of a place. I was running third and um, I broke my boom in the fifth race and then I got disqualified in the next race so it knocked me back a few places. But it must give you plenty of confidence uh, when the real Olympics do come round. Uh, yeah, well, it was good to see because um, it's the only regatta where the actual equipment's the same and uh, we're all on equal terms, so it's just up to the individual to do as well as he can. In August, Chris heads to the USA to train until the Olympics in October. He'll have the best of training partners, including the silver and bronze medalist from the pre-Olympic regatta. Police believe thieves who stole more than seven tonnes of aluminium from the Newcastle waterfront over the weekend might have blundered. It's thought they mistook the rods for a more profitable metal. For all the news, join us tonight at six. It's been two years since the Hutter Orchestra has played in local country towns. In the past, response has been overwhelming, and this tour is expected to be no different. The 45-piece classical size orchestra is playing at the Singleton Civic Centre tonight and the Merry Wall School of Arts tomorrow night. The program will include Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony as well as Mozart's Toy Symphony under the direction of Ulrich Burstein. Next Saturday in Newcastle City Hall, the Hunter Orchestra will be joined by a gaggle of celebrities on stage. Mark Richards and uh, Captain of the Newcastle Knights, Sam Stewart, and George Keegan, John McNaughton, and of course Anna Manzoni and Ray Deneen from NBN. But what are they going to do? Uh, they all have special music parts written for uh, which they will be playing. Uh, they'll be playing instruments like trumpets, drums, tin whistles, a whistle that spouts water, I gather, and nightingale, quail. These are all authentic musical parts written for toy instruments, uh, which uh, they will be playing. The Queensland manufactured laser was installed at the NIB Day Surgery Hospital at a cost of $60,000. The high-tech machine will be used to remove cervical lesions, a fairly common condition in women. According to the hospital's director, Brendan Pell, the conventional method burns and destroys the cervix. The laser is less destructive because it vaporises cells. While both treatments are equally effective, the recovery period is shortened using the laser technique. Dr. Pell says patients have accepted the use of the laser. Laser again is the form of treatment in the States, in America, rather than here, um, because of this post-operative uh, uh, easier um, uh, recovery. Um, and I think that when patients realise that laser is available, it's going to be a form of treatment they're going to request. The 
championships are for 12 to 15 year old girls from throughout the state. Billed as one of the largest single teams events in the world, the 231 teams in the competition have been split up to play on various courts in the area to accommodate the sheer volume of games to be played. At Lakeside, the 13 year olds are competing. Charlestown has the 14 year age group and National Park in Newcastle is hosting the 12 and 15 year olds competitions. After an official opening ceremony this morning at National Park, the first of 57 rounds to be contested over the next three days began. With teams playing an average of eight or nine times a day, spectators settled in for a long spell of top-class netball. Today's match between West and South was the game of the round. South were chasing another win to stay clear at the top of the table, while West needed to win to stay in touch for a finals berth. The only try of the first half came in the tenth minute, and Tony Amity scored after West's looked as though they had bombed the opportunity. No matter what South threw at West's, they couldn't crack the line. The Rosellas went to the break, leading 8-2. However, the Lions scored all the points in the second half and have ensured themselves a place in the finals. They now lead the Premiership by four points. Premier's Lakes are in equal second place with Central, while the Piers, Cessnock, Wests, Maitland and Macquarie will have to fight it out for the other two places. Hunter Institute of Higher Education has had a varied life, much of it on display this weekend in the form of memorabilia. The institute began in 1949 as the Newcastle Teachers College on the present day Merriweather High School site. It moved to premises in Union Street in 1952 before the latest buildings alongside the university were opened in 1970. It became a college of advanced education in 1974 and an institute of higher education this year. To date more than 20,000 students have graduated and this year saw an enrolment of 4,300, a far cry from the 181 who started 40 years ago. Harold Gillard taught the original students. He began as a PE lecturer in 1949 and retired as head of his department in 1975. Among his fond memories, refereeing a Newcastle-France rugby league match in 1952, a match Newcastle won. Very good game. You can see the crowd there. That rep rep represented about 18,000, which was a, a pretty good game. A highlight of your refereeing career? Yes, it was a highlight. Many other memories were relived this weekend as Institute generations, past, present and possibly future, turned back the pages on 40 years of education. Among the memory joggers, the first overhead projector, its descendants now an almost vital teaching aid. During the weekend, the graduates toured the Institute and attended a reunion dinner. The highlight, however, came this afternoon with a ceremony to present a perpetual reminder of the weekend. Bert Wood, president of the Retired Lecturers Association, unveiled a sundial donated by the association. Selectors have been watching games closely for players displaying special talent. Country teams are often overshadowed by their city counterparts, but this year the story was a little different. Maitland's 12-year team picked up their minor division trophy during presentation of places, and that was followed by the excitement of the talent squad selections. As expected, members of the top team in the competition, the Manly 15s took several spots, but more encouraging were four places out of 16 going to Hunter players. Lisa Budden, Catherine Sheedy and Fiona Wilson of Musselbrook and Angela Worm of Newcastle all gained a place in the squad's training camp at Armadale this Christmas. Another four girls from Maitland, Musselbrook, Lakeside and Charlestown were highly commended. State Director of Coaching Margaret Corbett says it's a good result for country. And it's really good to see them still there because they don't always have the competition that the Metropolitan do. So therefore it's all to their credit that they're still up there. 
And just as one competition finished, another started. National Park was also the venue for the opening rounds of the Winter Coal 88 Hockey Championships. More than 1,500 young people from colleges across Australia are in Newcastle for the city's first Winter Coal. They'll compete in dozens of indoor and outdoor games over the next week, including basketball, volleyball, Australian rules, squash and rugby union. Although it's the biggest event of its kind in Australia, organisers say they're ready to keep the show rolling along. We've been organising this for about approximately 21 months. Um, it's taken us a lot of time and effort. Just basically getting all the draws completed for the different teams, uh, hiring of localities like this one and the Broadmeadow Basketball Stadium and the number one and number two ovals. final decision to build the centre at Salts Bay caught many by surprise, coming just two days after Alderman inspected four proposed sites. During the inspection, the Aldermen were confronted by local residents, determined to convince the council that the Salts Bay option be dropped. The residents claim that with little parking provided at the centre, and none for coaches, the building will bring with it traffic problems and attract vandalism to their quiet neighbourhood. However, it is a battle they have now lost. The Society for Estuarine and Marine Studies, which will run the facility, told the council it would only consider the Salts Bay site as it provided access to both marine life and mangrove swamps. The centre will serve as an educational facility run along the lines of the Shortland Wetlands Centre. Last night the council came down on the side of the society. With the exception of Alderman Shields, all voted to approve the development with the condition that private buses be asked to park at the end of the road at Swansea Heads. Mayor Welsh says the council also included a provision that it would not be responsible for the upgrading of the dirt road linking the site to the street. The Premier visited the region today with his deputy, Wal Murray. Announcing the $25 million funds for the Hunter Sewage Project, Mr Griner said the aim was to eliminate the unsewered residential backlog in the Lower Hunter. He also announced a new funding scheme. In the past, the Hunter District Water Board, the Public Works Department and local councils paid equal thirds. Now the cost will be split 50-50 between Public Works and the Water Board. Mr Griner says that's good news for councils. That means that the people of the Hunter will literally get $25 million back through their councils, either in reduced rates or in uh, better services provided by their local councils. The Premier also announced an upgraded sewage scheme for Lake Macquarie. What we're talking about is decommissioning a variety of very old uh, plants which effectively feed into, uh, into the lake. Uh, we're going to stop completely uh, the feeding of sewerage into the waterways that, uh, that go into Lake Macquarie. We'll be extending the ocean outfall at Belmont uh, so that it's about a kilometre off, uh, off the beach and it'll be very highly treated. So uh, the overall impact is that Lake Macquarie City will have a sewerage scheme which is of, uh, of first class quality for the first time ever. Over 12 years, old outfalls should be replaced with a 700 metre offshore diffuser at Nine Mile Beach. Belinda Boris are reporting for NBN News. For residents in Fegan and Eden Streets in Wall's End, their problems began on Thursday afternoon when something went drastically wrong, causing many electrical appliances in the area to blow out. It's claimed there was a faulty connection of a transformer at the County Council's Fegan Street East substation. Today, residents gathered at the West Wall's End Scout Hall. They're worried that they might not get full compensation and that the whole process may become drawn out. In the meantime, they're left with a range of broken appliances from fridges through to televisions and videos. We are very concerned that we're going to end up in a situation like residents from Carrington. We do not want to go on to uh, a court battle for two years. We don't see why we should have to pay money out of our own pockets for something that was caused by persons other than ourselves.
club's bicentennial tribute to Australia's military has taken three painstaking years to assemble. Club members ranging from business people to school children have laboured ceaselessly with plastic, glue and paint to reproduce flawless miniatures of just about anything to do with warfare. The model maker's endless quest for microscopic exactitude has rarely come closer to realisation. Every theatre of war has been reconstructed on the basis of tireless research. There's an extreme amount of research goes into a model, uh, photographs, books, it may take um, 12 months sometimes to obtain all the information to, to complete a model. 600 people have had a look at the display in Broadmeadow Police Youth Club. Surprisingly, most of the viewers have been adults despite the school holidays. With typical attention to detail, the club has even recreated the uniforms of Australia's fighting men and women, from the first Marine to step ashore in 1788 to the uniform of the Australian Army's Bicentennial Guard at Buckingham Palace. All proceeds from the weekend will go towards the telethon appeal. The first 20 minutes of the game was a start-stop affair with 11 penalties and 3 scrums. And things didn't improve for the remainder of the first half as neither side could get into gear. Newcastle raced to a 4-0 lead with two penalty goals from Michael Keenan. Two penalties from Mark Bevan saw the teams head into the break for all. The first try of the game came 10 minutes into the second half. Cameron Blair touched down after the Magpies created an overlap. Straight from the kickoff, the Magpies made a break downfield which eventually saw Ian Howcroft cross the line. It was a disappointing game from the Knights, which again missed vital tackles and take advantage of good breaks. Falcons are still more than confident of beating the Canberra Cannons despite losing to East Side Melbourne at the weekend. It was a game that we uh, we didn't really prepare very much for. We've really been trying to zero in on Canberra, and uh, I can't get you know upset with players for losing a game that we didn't take seriously in the first place. Your coach takes the blame for those ones. So it was better not to go in and create any more pressure. We've been under enough for the last month, so it was just a free game. Meanwhile, on Thursday night, the Cannons plan to block one Newcastle forward out of the play. Coach Jerry Lee says they have to restrict at least one of the Falcons' main scorers to win. Lee says Newcastle depends on Jerry Everett, Wayne McDaniel and Michael Johnson for their points and can beat anyone on their night. Canberra is a hard uh, physical team. They're going to come out and try to um, really get after us aggressively. But we have to just come out and play our game. Jerry Lee, the coach of the Cannons, uh, believes that uh, you're going to be one of the danger men for the Newcastle team um, and that they're going to try and stop one of you. How do you think they'll go about that? Well, if we can just continue to play within the framework of our offense and just do our jobs, I don't think they're going to be able to uh, stop none of us unless we're just having an off night. A big plus for the Falcons, making it all the way to the grand final playoffs, is coach Ken Cole. History shows all the teams he's got to the final six always make the grand final. Newcastle University says that young people must learn about the area in which they live. It is extremely important if children are going to have an opinion about this country's resources that they understand all of the facts about their environment. It is essentially, from my point of view, an education program. Students entering the competition have to prepare an essay, poster or model on issues relating to the industry. With good prizes, including a trip to Queensland, organisers are expecting a flood of entries. Also this year, computer equipment worth $2,000 is being offered to the top school in the competition. Do you think there's a lack of awareness of the coal industry in the area? 
I think there's a total ignorance about industry at large, especially the coal industry. The competition closes on August 12 and the winners will be announced by the Lord Mayor at a presentation dinner early in September. industry performs over the rest of the year. Newcastle Coal Association manager John well, we've lost about 600,000 tonnes has brought coal reserves to an all-time low, dangerously reducing the industry's ability to offset the brunt of similar stoppages. They're about 20% of the levels they were this time last year, and that's been one of the difficulties in this strike, that we haven't had stocks to, uh, to maintain shipping. Which means that ships are now sitting idle? Yes, we have quite a number of ships waiting off the border at the present time, waiting for, for coal to come down from the mines. I believe that uh, not all the ships uh, were prepared to wait. That's true. There are at least two ships I know of that were uh, diverted by the Japanese to South Africa that were due to pick up coal from Newcastle. And uh, where you could say essentially we've lost 200,000 tonnes of uh, potential export coal because of the strike. The Coal Industry Tribunal is expected to reach a decision over the dispute on Thursday and coal unions will meet a day later. Their reaction will decide if the dispute is to escalate or not. players from all over the state are here for the tournament. They're competing in age groups ranging from under 11s to under 19s. They include two Australian champions, Shannon McNamara in the under 17 section and Adam Mikolif in the under 13s. Dean Mason, who is coached by squash great Jeff Hunt at the Institute of Sport, will be playing in the under 19s. All age division champions in New South Wales are competing. The championship, which is a part of the Lake Macquarie Games, is being played over three days, with the finals being held on Sunday. The championship, hosted by the Central Coast Rugby League, will be played at Graham Park, Gosford. Matches start next Tuesday, with the finals set down for Thursday afternoon. Two combined states teams will then be selected to play Central Coast sides Sunday week. Convener of the Carnival, Steve Balch, says the choice of Gosford for the championship should show off the standard of play. We found that by playing them in our own regions, we were playing in front of a uh, partisan a crowd who um, showed up and we played the football and went home and that was it. We decided that it was time that we took our football to an area where we could show the people in the game, um, and I'm talking here about the people of country New South Wales, that rugby league is alive and well in, uh, in the states outside Queensland and New South Wales. While on the Central Coast, the visiting state teams will also take part in coaching clinics and attend Sydney league matches. If the championships are successful, another will be held in Gosford next year. Eventually, it's hoped a national second division carnival will be developed, featuring the four minor states, as well as selected areas of New South Wales and Queensland. <laughs> 